folks. Happy holidays. Happy mid to late December. <laughs> happy did you know that it's called the clap because back in olden days they used to take two by fours and clap them together on a penis that was rotting with crystals inside it. <laughs> so then Anne just told me before we started recording. Welcome back to another episode of You Might Know Her From with Anne and Damien. We are here, just us two, left to our maniacal devices. Anne is bed rot from COVID <laughs> um, uptown. <laughs> I am in Harlem with Ronnie, um, who just ate carrot broth. And we're excited to be back here with you this week for our, I'm going to call it our annual holiday extravaganza. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, we are back. The strike is over. The contract has been ratified. We released Leia's Longa, which hopefully you listened to earlier this month. We're back in the groove, babe. So if you like what we're doing, if you're happy to have us back, of course, make sure you're subscribed and listening to us, what you're doing. Please make sure that you've left us a written review, a five-star review in the Apple Podcast app, if you will. But today we're back, just us two, to Movie Club, as we told you we would, that great holiday film, <laughs> Carol. But, but but before we get to that, and any housekeeping you want to talk about? I'm really glad to be here. I feel like my brain is a little bit both on ice and on fire from COVID this week. So I, I'm very excited for us to get into Carol, but I'm also excited that the Golden Globe nominations were announced today at the day of recording. I kind of forgot about them they used to be my number one favorite award show because they were like people were pilled out the entire time it was very loosey-goosey there was barely any food served and lots of alcohol so you got the best and worst of celebrity culture but then I mean they, they've always been an embarrassment as far as I'm concerned but then you know they basically didn't happen last year right is that right they didn't happen and now no, they back. didn't happen yeah and and nobody they, cared nobody cared they sort of like dissolved the HFPA, who even knows who they are and what they are. And yeah. I don't know, I guess there's a new version of them. But now I was reading some sort of like roundup of the nominations and they were saying that they're playing it safe. So, you know, like all of these award shows are stupid because they all just want to be precursors to the Oscars. And what made the Golden Globes and also the Indie Spirit Awards fun before used to be yeah. that they had like their own identity of like the Indie Spirit Awards really were for like indie films. And now it's like for the like the least expensive Hollywood film. And the Golden Globes used to be like stupid, drunk. Like, yes, there was some Oscar prognosticating that could come from it. But really, it was like just a celebration to have people from the industry all in one room together, a bunch of movie stars and A-listers. And now it feels like half that or, it, you know, whatever. But also they want to like be a part of the conversation and be like, we're predicting that Fantasia Barina will be nominated for an Oscar. It's like, OK, just let the Oscars be the Oscars. I'm so excited for Fantasia, by the way. I can't wait to see the color purple. I'm very excited. I'm a huge Fantasia fan. I know we both are. Same. And I couldn't be happier for her. Literally couldn't be happier for her. So let's just do a quick couple takeaways. I haven't seen everything that I want to see yet this season, including May, December, which is top of my list while we're talking about Todd Haynes movies today. Mm. So I can't speak to that yet. I have seen Oppenheimer, Barbie, Priscilla and maybe that's it so far you saw Priscilla you didn't tell me about that I did well I'm paying for AMC Stubbs so I gotta go use it and I was interested in it and I have to say that I don't even know how to say her name Kaylee Spaney Spaney I don't know how you Quoco. say her name Quoco Quoco Kaylee... if it was Kaylee Quoco I would have not gone <laughs> I would not have stepped foot in the theater it was I kind of really enjoyed it. I didn't love it, but I thought her performance was absolutely incredible. I think she's a star. She's very good. So I'm happy she got a nomination. I want to see Nyad because I love Annette Benning. I really want to see Past Lives because I love Greta Lee so much, and that looks beautiful. What else? What are you excited by? Well, I want to see Maestro. Oh, my God, Damien. I can't get over it. I cannot get over it. Did you see the actors on Actors with... Emma Stone and Bradley Cooper. He is so insufferable. He is so fucking insufferable. I kind of can't handle those things. I watched a little bit of Anne Hathaway and Emily Blunt, and I was like, "Did I, would I have been charmed by this before? Because I'm not right It was anymore. so not charming. Neither one of them was charming. And it, it was, it, I was like, oh, so they just, need to have somebody else direct this. This is not good. Yeah, it just wasn't. I don't know what 
Like I was like, have I just outgrown the thing that I I, I haven't because here I am on this podcast. <laughs> but <laughs> right. but I was just not charmed by it at all. It like lacked any charisma and like they had no chemistry and it was like all just like a lot of false modesty and weird stuff. Anyway, yeah, I'm interested in seeing Maestro. I'm interested. I haven't seen Saltburn yet. So I have a lot of things to say. But yeah, yeah I'm happy for former guest of this show, Divine Joy Randolph, that Ugh. she was nominated for Golden Globe. And I, I'm excited to see the, the holdovers. Is, is that what it's called? Holdovers? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I was going to say the leftovers, but I knew that wasn't right. Yeah. I'm so happy for her, too. I think she's a total star and I'm just waiting for Hollywood to sort of get it I mean, she's obviously had like a lot of good roles in the last couple of years including dolomite and that movie with sandra bullock that i saw but i think that she should be like she needs to have a breakout role maybe this is the one that's finally going to put her like in conversations do you remember that she told us she wanted to do a pearl bailey biopic and we both were like whoa i yeah. would die who would pick, die. play who would play carol channing in that oh my god what a great question. Like, I Emma feel like Stone. they'd cast. I know. I feel like they'd cast. I would be okay with Emma Stone doing it because I feel like she's kind of tall and lanky and has that weird Carol Channing body. But mm-hmm. I feel like they'd cast somebody. And she has like, a big face. She has like big yeah. eyes and a big mouth. Yeah. I could actually, I could get into Emma Stone. I feel like they would cast somebody like Anya Taylor Joy and I'd be like, why? Oh, interesting. I can see that now that you said it, but I never would have thought of her. Wouldn't want it. Wouldn't want it. I like Emma Stone better if we're going in this category. Well, I like Emma Stone because she's like, there's a goofiness about her yes. that I feel like would like, and but, and, but like, she could play it like starkly serious anyway I'm anything serious. else you want to say about the ggs i'm just looking to see if there's anything else i care about did our friend uh did she get a directing nod did sofia coppola get a directing nod mm, i don't think so but greta gerwig did and so did the director of past lives i okay. believe okay all right I'm i believe that. i believe I feel like there's a lot of stuff that I want to see. I think the big surprise for me was that I saw the trailer for Wonka, whatever, whenever they released the initial trailer, like months ago. I was like, wow, this looks so bad and so charmless. And then people were like, it's good. And I was like, what? Is this real? Is this real that this movie could potentially be good? I'm not, I don't think I'm going to see it. It looks like the Polar Express to me in a way that I'm deeply uninterested. But Sally Hawkins, as like what it seems to be Wonka's dead ghost mom, <laughs> Might be enough to get my butt in the theater. I'm not sure. I love her so much. So much. So much. Are you excited for Christina Ricci, who was nominated for Yellow Jackets? I am excited for her. I think she is wonderful in Yellow Jackets, and I am so happy for her. I think that she seems to be living an okay life. And I was having this conversation with my friend Angie recently about how, like, how is it possible that some child stars come out okay and some don't? How is it possible that some music stars come out of childhood and are okay like Justin Bieber is not okay do you know what I mean but like how is Diana Ross okay how is Janet Jackson okay I don't know how people survive being young stars and some of them just I feel like Christina Ricci's okay and I'm happy for her she's like married and maybe lives kind of a suburban life with her husband and kids into it I'm into it too you know what I'm not into I just need to clear the record about something. I'm so sorry if you are a Muppet purist. I need to. This has been keeping me up at night. And then I, our our mutual friend Aaron, saw Austin Pendleton like at a diner and texted us about it. And I was like, oh, by the way, that reminds me. I said Austin Pendleton on the podcast that he was in the Muppets Take Manhattan and it was really Lonnie Price. And Aaron was like, yeah, I was going to like DM you to correct you, but I decided not to. And then I was like, oh, God, other people are thinking this. <laughs> These Muppet people are thinking this, yes. So I just want to say that I know I messed up. I confuse young Lonnie Price and young Austin Pendleton. They're also like both men of the theater. So yeah. I don't. I think it is an honest mistake. And I also think that Austin Pendleton does have a role in the Muppet movie, which is my least favorite of the movies. That might be blasphemous, but I'm a Muppets Take Manhattan, then Mupp- uh, Great Muppet Caper person. So, and then and then the Christmas Carol, if I'm being honest. So, anyway. Christmas Carol's perfect. Lonnie Price is like the human male lead of of the Muppets Take Manhattan, <laughs> and Austin Pendleton has a small role in the Muppet movie. I'm so sorry for anyone who heard it, but it has been bothering me. So, I just, as a completist and as someone who wants to have a a good record. I just want to make sure that it's clear that I know that I messed up. Thank you for correcting our Muppet wiki that lives within the you might know her from wiki. Do you think that that guy still listens to us who wrote us a letter about Pepe the Prawn? Oh my god. 
Yeah, I hope so. He was like, if Damien still- and Anne, you are talking about Pepe the Prawn <laughs> and how he was on the Bonnie Hunt show and and like how he's not funny. And then I was like, you know what? This guy got me convinced because then he sent a very funny clip of Pepe on the Bonnie Hunt show. And I was like, yeah. you know what? I'm into it. So I hope Pepe's you're listening, sir. I have to say that I love that you said diner. I just want to say, I feel like it's okay to say what this place was, which is Ollie's on 42nd Street where Austin Pendleton was eating because I feel like it is the secret place of the great New York theater actors. Ollie's on 42nd Street. May it live forever. I've seen Lois Smith eating a bowl of noodles there before. (laughs) I left her be, but it is where New Yorkers of a certain age, and I think I'm entering into that age because I love Ollie's on 42nd. Long may it live. If you get here, I feel like it's a great pre-theater option for anything west of 8th Avenue. Love. All right, Anne. So I, uh, without further ado, should we dig into the Carol of it all? Let's dive in. I'm really excited. First of all, I, okay. Carol came out in 2015. I saw it years after. I would say probably three years ago I saw it for the first time. This is your first viewing. Is that correct? This is correct. This was my first viewing of Carol. And I have to say that Two people that I really respect in the world, both lesbians, both pop culture people, each host a separate holiday party annually, I think. I'm not sure. Yeah. So, Caitlin, if you're listening, Jess, if you're listening, I know you both yeah. have separately hosted Carol Christmas parties, which I love. And I have never seen it and always felt ill-equipped to attend or to engage in the conversation around it. And now, finally, I can. And I have to say, I took some notes here. These are notes separate of the notes we have together because I didn't want to spoil my thoughts for you. But the first thing I wrote as I was watching is, I don't think I've ever seen Rooney Mara in a film. I will confirm. (laughs) I think that you've seen The Social Network and that's the only thing that I've seen her in. And then I looked her up and I said, oh, I've seen this. Uh, And then I remembered that she's like the girlfriend breaks up with him at the beginning. Yeah, she has that like great scene in the at the very beginning. I was like, who's she? she? Yeah, she's like the catalyst for Mark Zuckerberg becoming a millionaire because <laughs> right. he, because she, because she ruined. She shut uh, him down. Yeah. yeah, she shut a loser down. So I have seen her in that, but just coming in hot, I get it. I understand the Rooney Mara thing. She was great, and also like, yeah. I agree. I love. I remember loving her in The Social Network, not knowing who she was. And then I've never seen the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo movies. So I don't really have a feeling about her. But I do feel like watching this again that I was reminded that she is really given the full Audrey Hepburn treatment, like in Roman Holiday with the bangs and the whole gamine look. She is stunning. But I really felt like her vocal work when I listened this time was actually Natalie Portman and Jackie. And I don't even know what the timeline of that film is, but she is sounds exactly like Natalie Portman to me. These were sidebars. I agree with you that I think she's very good. And I think the limited dialogue in the entire film, I mean, it's, I mean, to me, it feels like such a visual film. There's very little dialogue. And I think it's all cheekbones. Like the whole movie is cheekbones (laughs) and it's insanity. And I, I think it captures the, like the phys- they both of them capture the physicality of desire so well because they both look so insanely beautiful on camera. I definitely it's so funny I put in, I put Nat- in parentheses Natalie Portman vibes because I also got something about Natalie Portman from yeah. I guess from Rooney Mara. I think but it's I- her voice and and she is like has like a Jackie O Audrey Hepburn dark eyes dark you know sort of situation. I totally agree though that the entire film it it's based on a book from 1952 by Patricia Highsmith, originally titled The Price of Salt, and then I think it was, like, renamed Carol in the 90s. Um, and then she also published it under a pseudonym, and it's, like, based on a real-life relationship, dalliance that she had with this Philadelphia socialite woman. Who I Googled, by the way. The name of the socialite is on the Wikipedia, and then if you, like, Google her name, there are pictures that come up, and she's giving... I mean, I feel like it's really what the great Sandy Powell used as inspiration for mm, the costumes for Kate Blanchett, because, cool. like, it's very Kate Blanchett vibes. But knowing that it's based on a book what i what i want to know now is like is the book like a sensory narrative because re- watching it felt you know, me and you always have that bit about like they stopped making good movies in like 2006 <laughs> because like that's when we graduated college or whatever. And I feel like I was really into movies <laughs> for a period of time, like art films. And I feel like at a certain point I sort of became disenchanted with them. And this for me, and maybe it's just the Todd Haynes element, maybe that it's because it's queer, New York, who yeah. knows. But it felt 
so cinematic in a way that like so many movies don't uh, to me anymore and also just felt like you said such limited dialogue but so much said with what like the pan- Long glances a yeah. glove yeah, I was going to say, like, the, a, a solo shot of gloves on a counter. You I was like, know? that is erotic. Those gloves are erotic. Was it erotic that the, the place where they have their meat cute is essentially an American girl store? <laughs> or, I think well, I thought of it more like a Macy's. Like, a, what was the name yeah, of it? Totally, it? Yeah, totally. Um, I think it's like, like a Wanamaker's in the movie. Yeah, Frankenberg's in the movie, I think. But yes, no, I honestly, the meat cute. I think is iconic. Rooney Mara looks beautiful in the Santa hat and then Kate in the fur with the gloves. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous how beautiful they both look on screen. I have not read the book and I feel like the second viewing is the thing that's going to send me back to the book because Patricia Highsmith also wrote The Talented Mr. Ripley. Oh, and shit. I love the tone of both of these pieces so much, but there's also like this undercurrent of violence. Obviously the talented Mr. Ripley is much more physically violent, but when I, I knew that Carol had been regarded as a lesbian classic from the moment it came out. And I think what happened in terms of why I didn't see it immediately, because it's kind of shocking that you and I didn't see it mm-hmm. right away. Yeah. Like because, we didn't go to the theater to see this. What were we doing? Right. It's like, is that the year that Kate Union Blanchett. Square came out? Let's say. It may have been that we were consumed with Union Square around that time. I think that was earlier. That was like 2010. <laughs> my card got declined buying a ticket for union square but you know what i did i still went in to see it i found a way oh my god i love you i can't believe 2011 <laughs> that's so sweet that's sweet we used to have dates at the angelica we should bring that back we haven't been there in a while together but i so i was a big kate blanchett person from the time that i got to college and i loved her and i think what's interesting about why i resisted carol for so long was that because it felt like kind of it was being pushed in my face and you know that I'm nothing if not a contrarian in terms of somebody being like, you're going to love this. You're gay. You'll like this. It's like, don't shove it down my throat. I felt like I had gotten to a point where I had been saturated with Kate Blanchett and I was like, you know what? It's just like, I gave it a break because post Carol, I just like had to do this in my head. You know, I feel like I loved her from Elizabeth. I loved her from pushing tin with Angelina Jolie, which was like the first thing that I knew her from really. Also um, starring Vicki Lewis of you might know her from. Incredible. But th- when I went back through her catalog, I was like on top of that, there was also the aviator and notes on a scandal, which are all so queer. You and- want to fuck me, Barbara. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's, she really I'm gonna say something controversial I think she's not that good in New Tone of Scandal but like I love it but I think it's too much it it is too much but it's also excellent I think the it the movie is insane and the performances are insane and that's why the movie (laughs) is so great but I actually think this movie has something in common with Notes on a Scandal which is that I will never forget Judi Dench talking about like she has some monologue about somebody brushed her arm on the bus because this woman was so deprived of physical contact and was in love with Kate Blanchett's character but didn't know what to do with it but the literally being brushed on a bus as she was taking her seat was like gave her an erotic charge because she had no touch in her life and I thought that was so fascinating because I feel like that movie is also about desire and violence but also rape but I think I got tired at a certain point of everybody shoving Kate Blanchett down my throat because I was like I'm OG I've been here since the beginning I know I saw her in three plays uh, in New York and I remember I saw her in Hedda Gabler at BAM and we got these like $10 front row seats and I could see the moon on her fingernails and I was like this is incredible I saw her in Streetcar I saw her in The Maids with Isabelle Huppert also and Elizabeth Debicki it was like so gay the whole thing was so gay so I feel like she has and then she went on to do Ocean's 8 and Tar and she performed at Stonewall in 2017 I just feel like there was a lot of baiting of gay audiences and so I was like I'm gonna give Carol a break but when I finally sat down and watched it I did enjoy it I think I was expecting something different because I didn't allow myself to read anything about it so I was like there's a gun there's a gun in Carol I did not same I was not understand where it was going so I think there was like that tension that I didn't know was going to be present because I haven't read the book so I think that threw me for a little bit so upon like second watched once I knew what happened I was like 
okay, I feel like I got to concentrate on the visuals and the sort of eroticism of the camera work and the, it was just so, the whole thing is so lush. She looks like an Edward Hopper painting. Like I just, it is delicious to watch in that way. I don't know that it is like as erotic, like I don't think it's as hot as some films, but I do think that last shot of her in the restaurant like captures with the score that like percolating feeling of romantic desire that I think is very hard to capture on film. Well said. I I was in, that's interesting that you said the thing about the hot because I feel like so many times like sex scenes in films feel I mean, I don't know if that's true. I was going to say they feel clinical and like not hot, mm. but I don't think that's really true because I think I can think of some that are titillating to me. But I didn't find that the sex scenes particularly hot, but I don't know that they were made for me to find hot either. So right. I, I'm curious about your perception of them. I loved the line where Kate Blanchett's like taking her body in and she says something to the effect of like, I never looked like this. I was, I thought it was like a, such a cool yeah, that was a- lot, that piece of dialogue. I think the tension is always like for me, I feel like a lot of times, especially in queer movies where I feel like, you know, we were both seeking queer sex scenes as anywhere we could get them like basic instinct. I wore out a tape just like rewinding the bisexual scenes in that movie. But I, I think the tension is the sexiest part to me so that then when we do get to the sex scene, it's like that first touch, that first kiss is really it. And then the sex scene is sort of like, okay, we've already like, we've reached that point, but it's the build up to the sex scene that I think is the hottest. So I think what's interesting is Hannah said something to me and I was like, that's so interesting. And she was like, is this hot to you? And I was like, I don't think they're hot together. Exactly. I think the tension of the desire is what's hot, but she was like, I feel like the um, sex scene was, shot by it looks like it was shot by a gay man and I was like that is so interesting I mean it was first of all but I don't know that the tone of the book slash the screenplay was supposed to be like a super eroticized charged sex scene it is what it is between these two characters who are finally consummating this like months-long situation chip Mm -hmm. so I don't know I thought that was interesting but the movie does like it's so I mean it's like far from heaven it like is a beautiful series of paintings essentially with great performances but I do think that last shot for me is actually super hot of watching Kate Blanchett catch her eye and Mm -hmm. then and the music swells and then it's a blackout I loved it I, I think the last shot was actually super hot you know what I thought of when they say when they say their names? Well, when mm-hmm. they say when she asks Therese. Yeah, and I thought of Teresa Beck. I don't. I love that. That's your first connotation. I was like, I don't. I was like, I don't know if because Teresa. I don't think Teresa Teresa Beck says Teresa right, but it's spelled Teresa. Oh, is it? I don't know. I always called her Teresa Rebeck. Is it Teresa? I thought of Therese. I hope it's Therese. I think so, but I could be wrong. But I won't correct this piece. This is not. This is no Lonnie. Uh, Lonnie Price uh, over here. <laughs> Lonnie Anderson. I almost said Lonnie Anderson. Something else I thought was really cool was, and this I don't know if this is like my own like ADHD, like me not paying attention enough, or if this was true. But I felt like certainly the Jake Lacey character and his story. And to a lesser extent, Kyle Chandler's character, Harge. But I felt like both of them were sort of devoid of, like, any character development or any... Like, I didn't... We didn't really know who Jake Lacey was in relation to Therese Hilton. We knew that he was was probably (laughs) her... He was her beau of some sort, but he was like, I love you, but we haven't slept together. Anyway, we knew that he was like her boyfriend of some in some capacity, but we didn't really know anything. And then like she sees him again at the end. But again, I was like, this is cool because so often, especially in, you know, old film, but but still present day, like female characters are just like so and so's wife or girlfriend. So I liked that there were these male characters played by actors that we like quote unquote know that really were just like seen like were just like props to help push the story of like of these two women. I love was very into it. Me too. 100%. And I feel like Jake Lacey is such a archetype of a of like a straight white guy because he's just got that square head and those square shoulders. I love and him. He, he looks good in that little that I mean, the costumes are insanely beautiful. He looks so good when he's like in that trench coat that's like a waist trench coat tied up. I was like, oh, you look good, Jake Lacey. You look of the period. Yeah. And 
I was going to say, too, the thing I like about it that feels the queerest is though there is this trauma of Carol having to sort of, you know, fight for the custody of her daughter. She refuses to deny the relationship with Therese or what it meant to her. And so there isn't this thing of while there is the undercurrent of homophobia and the tension that the time period puts upon these two characters, there's not shame exactly. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like there's tension, but I don't feel like there's shame. And then Therese makes the choice, the active choice at the end to go join her at dinner. And I really like that because I feel like it could have been a gay trauma story and it really Mm -hmm. didn't end up being gay trauma, though there was stuff. But I feel like Carol... I loved the addition of Sarah Paulson as Abby. I feel like that was such a great grounding. Yeah, I really do feel like it grounded because Carol sort of seems like this sparkly, other otherworldly woman. And then it, of course, it grounds her character and gives her a backstory and makes her sympathetic in ways that I think what I understand is the book is only from Teresa's point of view. And so they split it in the screenplay, which was written by Phyllis Nagy, who also wrote Mrs. Harris. And so she's a lesbian and she had been like working on it for a long time, but she split the point of view so that we get both Therese and Carol's point of view, which I guess is different from the book because Carol is much more apparently like a figure that we, a mysterious figure in many ways. She is, she's Therese's Mr. Big, if you will. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's fascinating. I wonder how the book ends. Like, I'm curious like what the last page is. And if let's it's, read it, let's read it for 2024. Let's, I feel like we can do that in January. I think it's short. So let's, I'm into it. it. I'm into yeah. a book and I'm, I'm into reading more and I'm into a book that's short. The pros of this movie for me. Yeah. Well, I have one pro. I feel like I said all the things that I liked about it, but the, what, but it was under two hours, just under. And I think Thank that's God, a, that is the perfect running time. A, when I see something, even if you give me an hour 58, I'm in, you know? Yeah, like, exactly. This movie yeah. got nominated for something and it's under two hours. I'll watch it. Period. Okay. Um, some cons. Okay. Harvey Weinstein was still. Oh like my this- God. I I looked at that timestamp. I said, what? 2015? He was still around? I <laughs> yeah, forgot. Yes, I guess 2016 was when it started. Okay. And here's my most controversial opinion. Like, gay men have this thing where anything in pop culture that's about gay men, or we hate. Like, we hate, if there's a reality show and there's it's about gay people, we hate it. We'll criticize it. We'll say it's not accurate. If there's a gay, new one gay character on a show, we'll find a million reasons to hate them, or they're a stereotype, mm. or they're not a stereotype, and they're self-hating, etc. Gay movie stars, we hate them. We hate Neil Patrick Harris. We hate whoever. We, we I'm on board with that. Yeah. We hate whoever. We hate whoever. <laughs> I'm not saying we, but I'm just saying like the collective. Yes. L- lesbians, from my perspective, are more like, hey, come along. <laughs> and so in that, with that said, I thought having Carrie Brownstein in this oh. was incorrect it's like the l word being like oh chrishell from some <laughs> selling sunset came right. out let's put right. her and g flip in an episode of the l word no like, you don't need for? to who is this for yeah and i felt like seeing carrie bronson i was like oh she's so like current and then i was like oh is she not gonna have any lines okay i'm into it if she's like representative and then she has one line and you know what Anne? she's bad it was bad it was also adr <laughs> i thought so too it was bad and then she didn't know what to do with her hands and you know that carrie brownstein <laughs> She was my earliest, not earliest, but she was a very early crush leader. Kenny is so important to me. I Same. Have pictures, had pictures of her all over my wall. Like I pined for Carrie Brownstein for so many years. We saw us leader Kenny together at least twice. And I got very disenchanted. I even loved Portlandia. Like I got disenchanted when she showed up in Transparent. I was like, I guess it's, I mean, look, I'm not begrudging her. If I was her, I'd be like, great, give me this acting job. She worked at an advertising company for a year. She worked at Pitchfork for a year. She has had so many different different jobs and I think people like her and I used to love her but I did not want to see her in this either and I didn't remember how bad she was and in under 30 seconds you can understand that she's not good in this (laughs) I resented it and on behalf of Janet Weiss who's no longer in Leader Kinney I think this maybe was the beginning do you know what I mean it just felt like why like, you know what would have been cooler? Was she the best person for the fucking job? It would have been cooler if it was like Leah Delaria. Yes. Right. Or 
Miranda fucking July or fucking Kate Medig. Like, like there's just so many other like Jodie Foster. Can you imagine Foster. though, Kate? I would love to see Kate Medig in a period film <laughs> with a shag with her shag haircut. Yeah, yeah. I like Kate Medig because her hair is like now it's like to her shoulders, but it's like still the same haircut. It's yep. like it's like still a shag, but it's. Too- I can't wait till it's just to her waist and it still like has those same like razor. It's like someone's still cutting it with a yeah. razor. Yeah. Uh, the Sally Hirschberger. <laughs> anyway, before we lose everyone, I, I don't, I love Carrie Brownstein. I just felt like it took me out of the film a little bit. And yeah. then for a minute I was kind of like, oh, like this, she's sort of representing, you know, like you could, in her fashion, they are, it's all coded. And then I was like, okay, cool. Yeah. She's just, she's just a prop. And then she had a line and I was like, oh, good. Mm, cut it. Well, we know that there were a lot of people in this movie and a lot of scenes got cut. I think the original director's cut was much over two hours. So oh, I'll be interested to, I'll have see. to see. After I watch that. And like, how did Carrie's scene make the cut? She was in that party scene and she made the cut. But I wanted to bring up one thing while we're talking about actors. And that is that like, I also thought Rooney Mara was good. But I think the thing that held me back from liking the Maras for a long time was that someone told me that their parents are extremely wealthy. And when I Googled it to just fact check, her mother's family founded the Pittsburgh Steelers and her father's family founded the New York Giants. So they have two football dynasties in their family. And I was like, this should be all that anyone talks about. Not because they need to be blamed for it. I think they're both very talented, the Maras. But I just like, wow, 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 wow. They're billionaires? I I don't know. They're they're both heiresses. They are heiresses. Do you think that Rooney I started to like do some preliminary research to be like, is there any version where she is queer? I know mm. she is with or Ja what is his name? Ja Rule, Joaquin Phoenix. Oh, I was gonna say Ja Queen Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny because I <laughs> Speaking of corrections on the record, I have always <laughs> called Cillian Murphy, Cillian Murphy. And Sarah was like, ha, 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 LOL, it's Killian. And I was like, oh, I guess that makes sense because he's Irish. Oh. But I have said Cillian with a C, with a soft C. So Killian, Cillian <laughs> and Joaquin. <laughs> I was like, it's not right, but that's what like, my brain is reading it phonetically in my head. And I'm like, Joaquin. He seems very serious to me in a way that is not appealing. I think he's talented, but it's a lot for me. He's a lot for me. Yeah. But Kate Mara did date Elliot Page, right? Or they had like yes. a, they had they an had affair. A thing. They had and a I'm in, affair. And I'm, I'm into that. I agree. I agree. One other thing about the film is I didn't really remember that there's more Christmas in it than I had anticipated. And I think the colors and the saturation of the colors make the whole thing feel Christmassy, even if it just is that opening bit at Christmas. Yeah, I was in it. That was my going to be my last question is, do you think Carol is a Christmas film? I think the iconic imagery of Rooney Mara in that Santa hat in their meet cute, because that is such an indelible scene. I, I think, yes, it qualifies as a Christmas film. And I have to say it makes New York look really beautiful. However, it was shot in and around Cincinnati, which makes me want to go to Cincinnati <laughs> because I thought it looked really pretty. I agree. I was surprised to see that note from you, but yeah, I thought it, I think it felt like a great, both New York and also Christmas film. So I'm a, I'm, I'm putting it in the, in the, in the Christmas gay Christmas canon, which I'm not sure that there are that I can't think of a gay Oh no, There's that Michael Yuri one. Okay. And then okay, I didn't see that. And there's happiest season, which I cannot vouch for. That was awful. That was, awful. I have also seen that. And it was, <laughs> I have also seen that it's Kristen Stewart. And who's the other woman? The woman from San Junipero. I can't say the actor's name, but. Oh, is Aubrey Plaza also in it? Yeah, she's the ex-girlfriend, yeah. Okay, And she is good in it. She is good in it. Yeah. Okay. Well, there we go. Apparently BFI listed Carol as the best LGBT movie of all time in 2016. How do you feel about that? Of all time? I don't know that I have like a, this is the best gay film, actually. I don't have that. But I was surprised. I do think it is a gorgeous film. I think it's well acted, well directed. The screenplay is great. And it honestly has a happy ending, I would say. So I feel like that in and of itself makes me yeah. please. So many gay movies have too much trauma and or about like the coming out process. And you're like, I don't need another one of these. 
Just thinking. Bros. I I think I said this on the record, or maybe I didn't, but I hated bros more than I've hated something in a long time. And I know there's this argument about gay films that, like, we just need more because it's okay to have a bad gay film come out. We need to be able to hate gay movies. It just means that, like, if something comes out, of course, we all shit talk it. Maybe you're right. Maybe lesbians don't. Maybe we're ready because I feel like there's fewer lesbians on screen than than there are just in terms of, like, there are more men on camera, even though I know in general, I think that lesbians get a softer edit in the real world sometimes than gay men, depending on how they present. But I feel like in cinema, usually there are just more movies for men, even if they are gay men. But I like this idea that maybe lesbians are more open to representation good and bad i mean yeah y'all are y'all are like (laughs) y'all are like okay so we're making a new show about lesbians and tila tequila's in it it's like okay and we're like i'm in (sighs) i love it i had to like stay up to tape the episode where like lucy lou kissed calista flockhart on ally mcbeal or whatever it was you know it's like those were that was appointment television. We will take what we can get. Who kissed Roseanne? Muriel, Muriel Hemingway. Hemingway. Yes. Yes. Muriel Hemingway. Yeah. I remember that was like important or something. It was significant to me. I wa- my, my parents like watched it with me and like Ellen's coming out episode. There was a lot. Why did Roseanne kiss Muriel Hemingway though? Like it's like, it is just an example of like November sweeps, like lesbian. Oh, kiss, it was definitely, right? yes, it was a sweeps thing. And they ended up at a gay bar. I can't remember the full episode, but Jackie is there too. And they're at a lesbian bar, right? That's what it is. And then. Is it also Hemingway like, kisses her. isn't there like this? I just need to watch, maybe rewatch the last season of Roseanne. Please refresh my memory here. If you remember, but like, isn't the whole thing like in that, like Roseanne, the whole season is a dream and then she's like and jackie is really a lesbian like the the, or like and the mother like the mother her mother became a lesbian on the show in the later seasons but then in like the thing it was like jackie was a lesbian it's like yes yeah and dan was dead and she won the lottery and this was all like a story she was writing honestly I know people are like, it jumped the shark, but when I went back and rewatched all, what, nine seasons in order, it didn't end as badly as I remembered that it ended. Though, as I'm saying it out loud, it sounds insane. <laughs> I know there's an episode where they're with, aren't they like with Dawn French in like yeah. a... It, and <laughs> yeah. There's like a weird crossovers with other stars, and then yes, the Ab Fab crew comes over. It's... It, it's a mess, and I I feel like we lament the loss of Roseanne Barr every day, you and I, because we both is the have Connor such love for still her on? That show. I think it is. I think it is. And like in that version, it retconned everything from that final season. I'm assuming. Um, you know what? I might have to watch it at some point. People, I've heard it's good. Have you heard that? Am I listening to the wrong? It people? almost has a hundred episodes. That's crazy. They are. Sarah Gilbert is raking it in, and <laughs> <laughs> Roseanne is so mad. Yeah, I'm sure she is. That's crazy. Okay, cool. Do you think Nine- Linda Perry and Sarah Gilbert watched Carol together? Were they together when it came out? Let's see. That's a great question. I'm r- really into it, and I'm not being hyperbolic. <laughs> 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 oh, my God. Sadly, they got... Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. They were only a year into their marriage. They 100% watched oh, it. Oh, thank God. They definitely <laughs> did. And... So- <laughs> Linda Perry probably got up and was like, Hannah, and she was probably like, this shit looks like it was directed by a fag. (laughs) (laughs) And Sarah was like, babe. (laughs) Sit down, sit down, sit down. Christine Vachon. (laughs) I don't fuck with her after she took me off that one soundtrack. After she took me off the Boys Don't Cry soundtrack. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god, Kimberly Pierce was attached to direct at some point. I saw that on the wiki. I like wait, what did Kimberly Pierce direct recently? Mm, I don't remember. Can you check for me? I don't know. Do you remember we talked about Kimberly Pierce with Natalie Z because they were like at an award show and Natalie was like, Do you have your student film of Boys oh Don't Cry? Oh my god, because Natalie Z was in the student film of Boys Don't Cry. She Holy played shit. the Chloe, Chloe Sevigny role. Yeah. Oh my god. We need that tape so badly. Oh, interesting. Kimberly Pierce's career is interesting. So I've only seen one of her movies because I didn't see Stop Loss, which in my brain is a war movie. Is that true? I don't know. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And then she did the remake of Carrie, which I never saw. 
Oh, I didn't either, but I I heard it wasn't bad. I'm kind of but into that. She, I think she does a lot of TV. I think she's done episodes of P Valley, and I think I remember that now. I also want to say that she did an episode of has done episodes of like the L Word, maybe, and also that seems like right. other shows we like is my memory, but I don't know. Anyway, wow. Are you here with us, folks? Are you here? Did you make it? Happy, happy holidays. Um, by the time you're listening to this, I think Hanukkah will be over. Yes. But Christmas will be approaching, as will Kwanzaa. And I don't know. And I guess New Year's. Are there other holidays that I'm not remembering? I'm sure there are other ones. We hope that you're having whatever kind of holiday season you want it to be, whether that is yeah. with people or whether that is solo dolo, whether it is buying lots of gifts or making gifts or not getting any gifts, uh, whatever makes you have fucking peace of mind, because Jesus Christ, it's a dumpster fire. Can you hear my sink guggling in the background? <laughs> you know, like we're all just doing the best we can, including me and this old ass building I live in. Babes, if you like what you're hearing, make sure you follow us on social media. We're at Damien Bellino and Rhoda Man on all mediums. That's R-O-D-E-M-A-N-N-E. And... Please follow You Might Know Her From on TikTok and Instagram. That's where we're putting content videos of actresses from the pod, people we want to have, people that are dead, people that will never have. Join us online to continue the conversation because this podcast, You Might Know Her From, is produced by us, Ann Rodeman and Damian Bellino, these two people in your ear holes right now. Thanks for sticking with us in 2023. We are excited to bring you some really nice supremo content in 2024 which by the way damien we didn't even tease but we have a person that we have been angling for since day one that we secured pre-strike that we will be releasing in 2024 and we are so excited for you to hear it we also want to thank our consultants at grumpy entertainment jason jude hill and daniel sears and all of that beautiful editing you hear is also by the wonderful daniel sears Special thanks to Gang. All the music you hear on each and every episode of You Might Know Her From is courtesy of Gang. You can download and stream Gang wherever you listen to your music. Do you want to see a picture of Lonnie Price versus Austin Pendleton? Side by side. Side by side even. Do you want to see Roseanne kiss Muriel Hemingway? Do you want to see what Carrie Brownstein's one line looks like? Anne's going to put that on YouTube for you and then link it in (laughs) the show notes of this episode that you're listening to so go to wherever you're listening and you'll see it's a treasure trove where my cohort here puts all of these little tidbits for you so that you don't even have to put your fingers to alta vista to look anything up it is all right there for you ask jeeves be dead okay so damien i have covid and i'm brain dead but i i as I have tissues in my pocket, I was thinking of something I wanted to ask you. And that is when you are full of a phlegmy cough and you cough and then you're like, okay, the phlegm needs to come out of my mouth. And then you spit it into a napkin or paper towel or tissue. Do you then look at it? Yeah. 100%. Who doesn't? Okay, I'm, just, I'm just checking. I didn't know if everybody did that. And I feel like some people are ashamed of their own bodily fluids. And I feel Do like you? It's, Oh, yes. And I examine it closely and I monitor it and I just see how it changes. Yeah, it's important for the healing process. Yeah, I think it's I mean, you know that I'm like a stickler for consistent like I like slime. So mucus is something that's like vaguely interesting to me. Do you ever put like like when you're like look at it, you close it back up and then do you ever like squish? (laughs) Yeah. And then you're like, oh, well, I'm not touching it, but I do get to roll it around. (laughs) Yeah, this is disgusting. (laughs) 